First, if any of you fall asleep after that classical music, <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment. I'm here to shed light on the subject and the science of sleep. Sleep is something that's very important. I'm a family and sports medicine doctor. I take care of elite athletes down to us mere mortals. And I ask every one of my patients three things. Number one, how's your eating? How's your exercise and how's your sleep? Because I truly believe if we eat well, move well, sleep well, we will be well. Now eating is very important. We've done several ketogenic meetups at actually eat that have been sold out and, and that's very good. And we encourage a low carb, healthy fat Mediterranean diet. For exercise, we encourage you to build up to an hour of cardio a day and do twice a week postural type weight training such as Pilates. Sleep's a little bit more nebulous. I was fortunate enough this year to go to Ireland for the summer and you know the Irish are fun, they, they sound good, they have great proverbs and I really resonated with this one that a good laugh and a long sleep are the best cures. So let's first look at who are world-class sleepers. So in the area of sports, Andre Iguodala with the uh, Golden State Warriors uh, has won two of the last three championships with his team and he embarked on an improved sleeping program and once he did that his points per minute went up 29 percent, his free throw percent went up 8.9 percent and his three-point percent doubled and he's not alone. LeBron James who's won multiple championships, plays for the Cleveland Cavaliers, is legendary for demanding and getting 12 hours of sleep at night. So uh, before I introduce the next person I do have a full disclosure. I was the team physician for the San Diego Chargers. Uh, we had some success, uh, never quite won the Super Bowl, and I personally take that as uh, somewhat my fault. I maybe didn't study enough. The second part was this person, Tom Brady. Uh, so God obviously can't spread it around. He's got to give him rugged good looks, supermodel wife, multiple championships, and oh, by the way, when I'm doing this, he's a super sleeper. But he is very regimented to get to sleep by 8.30 every night. So we've seen they have success, that good sleep uh, correlates into good uh, performance. And that even though we have the, the one that says, the rhyme that if you snooze, you lose, I really believe if you snooze, you win. So sleeping is very important. We all know that. How about the flip side? What about the problems if you don't get good sleep? It increases your risk for Alzheimer's. It turns out our brain doesn't really have a lymphatic system in the traditional sense. The lymphatic system gets rid of the waste products of every other organ during the day, only in the brain at night. So if you don't get good sleep, you can't get rid of especially amyloid proteins that build up and are a major cause of Alzheimer's. It increases your risk if you don't get good sleep of diabetes, cardiac disease, mental illness, which we're having a big challenge with, especially uh, anxiety, depression, and then obesity. Yes, if you don't get good sleep, you become overweight. If you get overweight, you actually start snoring and then you might get sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is where you have shortness of breath at night. So sometimes you're not sure the sleep apnea causes the obesity or the obesity causes sleep apnea. And we'll do sleep studies. And you can go to a place, but now they have it where you could do it at your house. And so they'll actually do sleep monitors. They'll actually video it. And on one time, the sleep specialist told the patient, I got good news and I got bad news. Good news is that shortness of breath is not sleep apnea. Bad news is we found out Fluffy the cat is sleeping on your face. <laughs> so not everything is sleep apnea. And those of us with gray hair in the audience know about uh, uh, what you do on a cold winter's night, three dog night. You bring the dogs in with you. And you can imagine how this might upset your sleeping situation. But if I ask a patient, how's your sleep, and they slept, gosh, I slept like a baby, that tells me you don't have a baby. <laughs> or, or, for the guys, you're not the one who gets up with the baby. <laughs> so a lot of things can interrupt your sleep and cause some sleep problems. As an aside, getting ready for this talk can interfere with your sleep. But it's important to get good sleep, and especially because those of us, think about when you last were sleepy while driving. There's over 100,000 auto crashes because of driving while sleepy, which is akin to driving while under the influence. And where I'm really challenged and really concerned about is our elderly. 
You know, no one's ever woken up like, gosh, I slept like a senior. Because we know our seniors <laughs> don't sleep well. Fully a third of them are on something. Sometimes it's over-the-counter medicines used for their side effects. Sometimes it's some supplement that has not been shown to work. And then, worst of all, we end up having to give them pills, uh, which actually double the risk of a hip fracture. And the way that works is you give them a sleeping pill to try to help them to sleep. They get a little disoriented. They got to urinate at night. They got to pee at night. They get up, they're disoriented, they fall, break a hip, and now it's a bad spiral down. So we know that they need sleep yet our current paradigm of sleeping isn't working. Uh, I'm here to say that we're on the brink of looking at other things. And sort of in the spirit of Einstein, he said that the problems of today cannot be solved at the le same level of thinking when we created them. And so I want to introduce you to how light can be medicine. So this is a disease you've never heard of, conicterus. It is a disease that happens, un unfortunately, in newborn babies when they get accumulation of the breakdown product of their blood. So when you're in, you know, in the womb, you're a fetus. When you come out, you're a neonate, and you've got to change blood. And when you change that blood, you've got to get rid of the old blood, which is actually in the form of bilirubin. And if you can't get rid of it, it builds up. It overwhelms the liver. That's why they get jaundice, just like if they're alcoholic. And then it goes in the brain, stains the brain, the brain irreversibly. So this is a preventable situation in a sense, but it's imagine if you were that mom or that dad baby's born, perfect baby, three days later, irreversible brain damage. And the only treatment we had up until the 1950s was to do blood exchange transfusions until this astute nurse, uh, Nurse Jean Ward, she's also a sister. And she had two particular things. Number one, she always demanded she got to take her children, her newborns, out for sunlight every day. And they noticed her kids never got cornicterous. And the doctors kind of poo-pooed it until they finally realized she's on to something. And it turns out if they get a certain amount of light, and many of you have had babies know that they have these billy lights. They're these blue lights that they put the baby under. And when it touches their skin, it changes the fetal hemoglobin bilirubin into a kind they can simply urinate away, averting the brain damage. And they also know, even in the 50s, that blue light's not great for our eyes. So they're very regimented how much blue light they get in. So when I heard this story, I'm like, why did the doctors, why were they reluctant? Now, I'm a big fan of nurses, but also, why did the doctors not pick up on that? And I think, and what's been proposed, is that we as doctors usually go to medical school as either biology majors or chemistry type majors. There's other majors too. Very rare do we get a lot of formal education on the uh, whole process of light. So let me talk about light. So we like light. This is a rainbow. We all love the color of a rainbow where the blue light is balanced. And our biology is set to that. We need that. And in fact, this came very vivid to me is uh, last year we planted an acre of Cabernet Sauvignon. And there's something called photosynthesis. We're literally, and this is kind of tough to wrap my brain around, that they want us to plant grapes because they're drought tolerant. So they need very little water. They need the oxygen, or the, I mean the carbon dioxide that we breathe out, and, s and light, and you can make all the wonderful grapes and, and all the plants of the world. So it turns out that you can learn a lot uh, from growing grapes. Uh, did I mention I joined the SWAT team here in Temecula? Not, not that SWAT team, this SWAT team, the Small Wine Growers Association of Temecula, <laughs> SWAT. I found out when you sit in the back, they said, well, win or lose, we always booze. I mean, wine taste. <laughs> but I learned a lot about light, and, and they do a very good job at one of the local wineries. But light is medicine, and like any medicine, you can overdo it. So we all know not to get too much light, or you'll get like this. And, <laughs> and please do not run out and tell your dermatologist I told you to get a sunburn, because I think sunburns are bad. However, we've kind of hammered it into our heads that sunlight is bad, stay indoors, that's where it's safe, and I end up treating this all day, which is basically people, vampires who, their vitamin Ds, 80% of people's vitamin Ds are very, very low. And while they say that the indoor is safer, as the Joker might say, riddle me this, Batman, why is melanoma higher with indoor workers than outdoor workers? 
wires. Just last month, there's an article that the increase in amount of artificial light increases your risk for breast cancer. So I want to just emphasize that we need to learn about light, have a good respect for it. And my opinion with my patients is to Goldilocks your light. Remember that fable? You don't want too much light, but I would recommend you don't get too little. On a darker kind of sadder note, Saddam Hussein used to torture people with light deprivation and sunlight, light deprivation and sleep deprivation. Might we be doing a little bit of that to ourselves? So what I encourage my patients to do, and if you have problems sleeping or have people that are having problems sleeping, think about this two-step ritual. Now, if you can explain this to a teenager, please do not use the word ritual. <laughs> Tell them it's a biohack. That just sounds dangerous and stuff. So we're gonna biohack their life by trying to get morning sunlight and protect your eyes from indoor light. So morning sunlight's unbelievably amazing. The, the science gets very heady, but essentially the sun is my supplement. The sun will make melatonin photosynthetically through your eyes up into your brain if you give it morning sunlight. And it only happens in the morning. Because while our eye is a very good camera, it's actually a more precise clock. That's why you get jet lag. If you're off, we call that circadian mismatch, it needs sunlight to set the clock to know, should I make melatonin or release melatonin? So morning sunlight, you've got to get it every day, literally to paraphrase that old orange, uh, orange juice commercial, a day without sunshine is a day without sunshine. Like you need sunlight. Now, if you can't get it 20 minutes looking towards the east, so face east and, and kind of get that in, kind of relax. If you could maybe pray that the Chargers win one game this year. Uh, <laughs> If you can't do that, you're too busy, crack the window. You need to get full spectrum sunlight not blocked by sunglasses or glass. Glass actually cuts down some of the helpful lights. And if you want to go full hippie, then you could be like Dr. Jack Cruz, who's one of the thought leaders in this, and you actually uh, sit uh, with your feet on the ground looking towards the east, and uh, that will actually uh, intensify it. So now let's look at the indoor light. So it turns out, this is not well known, is that where we spend 90% of our time, actually right now, is indoors that actually has these sort of technologies. The problem is this is not white light or balanced light. This is blue light. That's how they become energy efficient. And while we think that's so great, there's starting to be some biological toll from this unbalanced blue light. Increase your risk for prostate cancer, breast cancer, diabetes, obesity, and for the sake of this talk, insomnia. And actually there's now something called iPad insomnia. I told that to one of the college kids. She goes, that's okay, we have an app for that. It's called a nap. Sorry, that was my only dad joke, I promise. I just said. <laughs> but why does an iPad keep us awake? It's because the blue coming off of our screens that we love is the same as high noon. You literally are looking at your phone about 150 times a day is what studies show. And you're telling your brain, wake up. And no wonder it takes you a tough time to fall asleep. So what can you do? Well, you could give up and just go camping because, and not glamping. So if there's a, lark, there's a light dark cycle, we actually fall asleep within three hours of sunset. But what you can do is actually night shift your phone. And those of you, again, with gray hair don't know how to do this, find smug, some smug millennial or something. And uh, they're more than happy to tell you how to do that. So there's a lot of filters, but we don't just look at our phone. So I encourage the use of technology glasses. So you can talk to your friendly neighbor optometrist, and I've got these for the day, if I'm on the computer a lot, that block the blue light. And then at night, after sunset, you can actually put on amber uh, technology glasses that also block the blue light. So it's a biohack, it's a workaround. Is it perfect? No. Do I get made fun of? Yes. But I like to channel my inner Bono. <laughs> Casey gets sick. That there, he uses it for glaucoma, but we can use it for a lot of other things. And now in sports, the University of Tennessee is using it, and they actually have a sleep coach, and they follow it on an app, and they've put uh, sleep to the same level and status as uh, eating and exercise. So. Now I want to kind of talk a little bit about, uh, I actually when I was young, about 14, I rode my bike from near Big Bear, I mean near Huntington Beach up to Big Bear. It was about 100 miles. We did it without uh, any helmets. In those days you could just do that. Now we weren't totally stupid. We did have a dime in our sock in case we broke down. 
those of you that old might remember that. But we wouldn't let our kids go around the block anymore without these ugly looking helmets, but we're doing it to protect our kids. And just recently with the eclipse, they did that. Um, we got to protect our sun, uh, our, our eyes from the sun. I think we should learn about light. We need to understand that light is good, but it has its dangers, and we need to learn about it. And this is part of our research at University of Riverside, Sandy, I mean, uh, University of California at Riverside. Uh, I and a group are looking at the way to incorporate this, especially with the seniors. We actually give them, get this Fitbits, and we follow them on, on an app called Nudge Coach, and we can help them and, and sort of shepherd them to get good sleep and ideally get off the medicines. So in summary, light is medicine. And if you really want to be good, I'm giving you an excuse, a medical reason to goof off in the morning, go outside, get your melatonin, try to find out what you need for light, and then protect your eye from technology. And then I'll leave you with a picture of our family vineyard at sunrise with the thought that now I hope you eat well, you move well, and sleep well. Now that you know a good night's sleep starts in the morning.